club i'm horrible with titles but the gun mm -hmm. club one oh my gosh oh oh we're live we're hey live. <laughs> hi everyone so fast. Uh, yeah, we're just here with Katharina Vermette, uh, and we're doing a Facebook Live today with her, and we're the Canadian Women's Foundation. As you know, we've been doing uh, great lives with authors and amazing people doing incredible things. So we were just chatting about publishing and the different houses and the incredible voices that are coming out now in literature. So um, I am Andrea Gunraj, and I work with the Canadian Women's Foundation. And as I said, we have Katharina Vermette with us on the other end. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bio for you about Katharina. She's a Métis writer from Treaty One Territory, which is the heart of Ma the Métis Nation in Winnipeg. She's a gifted storyteller. Anybody who's read her stuff will understand what I mean when I say that. She's adapted her voice to poetry, novels, film, and graphic novels as well. Her first book, North End Love Songs, is a tribute to the area where she grew up, and it won the Governor General's Literary Award for Poetry. Her first novel, The Break, was a national bestseller and won the Amazon.ca First Novel Award, the Bird Award for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Young Adult Literature, and three Manitoba Book Awards. She's also written a picture book series for children, The Seven Teaching Stories, and the graphic novel series, A Girl's Call Echo. Katharina wrote and co-directed a short documentary, This River, which won the 2017 Canadian Screen Award for Best Short. So um, keeping yourself busy, I see. That's really awesome. A little bit busy these days. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, it, you know, keep yourself out of trouble, I guess. That's what they say. So Exactly. You know, I like a little <laughs> franticness. You know, I have a lot of kids. I have a lot of dogs. I write a lot of stuff, you know. <laughs> Thrive in the chaos, right? That's right. Um, and just a little bit about the Canadian Women's Foundation where I work. We are Canada's public foundation for gender equality. We support diverse women, girls, and people affected by gender inequity to move themselves out of poverty and out of violence and into confidence and leadership. These days, we're of course really focused on raising funds to address the unique ways the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting diverse women and girls and intensifying the barriers to equity. But the reality is that we're in pandemics within a pandemic. This is the way it's been for a while and something has to change. That's why we've launched the Tireless Together Emergency Fund. We wanna make sure women and girls in every province and territory can access services designed for their unique needs. If you'd like to give to this important effort, we'd encourage you to do so if you're able. You can do so by clicking the donate button below or giving at our website, which is canadianwomen.org. So before we get into the heart of it and, and ask Katharina a bunch of tough questions, uh, I just want to get some housekeeping done. If we get cut off in this live, you just hang tight. We're going to get right back on it. We're in it together. We know technology is not always our friend in these days and everybody's using the internet. So I guess it gets overwhelmed. Please don't click on any sketchy links that might appear below. Um, just, just be mindful and be careful because sometimes people do silly things and, and terrible things on the internet. And of course, as I mentioned, you can give to the Tireless Together Fund by clicking on the button below that says donate, or you can go to our website at canadianwomen.org. So welcome again. Thank you for joining us, Katharina. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. First things first, where are you and how are you doing? Um, I am in Winnipeg, uh, right in the heart of, uh, well, I'm kind of adjacent to downtown Winnipeg, right by yeah. the Red River. And um, I'm doing great. You know, we're, we're been, we've been very lucky in my family as far as health and, and no COVID to speak of, um, aces to that. I know that we're uh, again, pandemics within pandemics, there's a lot of people struggling in this city and, and in this province, even though we do are fortunate to have really low COVID numbers. Um, but thankfully, gratefully, um, I, we are okay right now. Yeah. Wonderful. Great thriving to hear that. Thriving in the that. chaos. But <laughs> yeah, thriving in the chaos, as you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, speaking about thriving in chaos, you have spoken about how writing is your way of understanding and interpreting your world. So tell me a bit about what you're writing through now, given the state of the world and this pandemic's within a pandemic, and tell us if you're discovering anything new in the process. Um, well, it's funny for me because I actually I had a baby this earlier this year, so my life hasn't really changed. My personal life hasn't changed that much since 
you know, I've been self-isolating since like December, you <laughs> yeah. know, um, I really appreciate this Zoom life. You know, this Zoom life fits us little introverts who don't want to <laughs> wear real pants in the world really, really well. Um, so, I mean, my life feels like it's kind of been normal other than all my kids have been home. They've been, um, I have two young adults um, and two tiny little babies and my young adults have been stuck at home. They haven't been able to go anywhere. And, and you know, it's, it's the least of, of the problems, right? So there's other than a lot of people in my house, you know, my life was kind of going to be this way. Um, I'm currently writing a, a couple of novels that I did start before, before all of this happened. So I don't know that they're necessarily, I mean, of course, we, we are always constantly absorbing everything that's going on around us. So I don't know how um, things are going to plan out because I'm kind of in that later stages of, of creating the novel where there's lots of polishing and editing going on. So, I mean, inevitably there's, these are stories, uh, the story that I'm writing um, and concentrating on is about women who are very isolated yeah. and the idea of estrangement in families and how that is one of the, you know, cause I like to talk about trauma. Anyone who knows me, I, I, talk, I tend to talk about the sad yep. stuff a little bit. Um, so it, it is kind of how we do isolate ourselves as a, as a response to being traumatized and how, how further we are isolated sometimes by force through um, uh, either incarceration or in this, um, one of the issues I'm dealing with is in the book is a uh, uh, child welfare system. So families being separated and taken apart. So I am dealing with very lonely people in a very isolated kind of world. So I do think that that will really take on a lot of what's going on in this and all of the struggles that I think people are, are, are having right now. I know I've, I've read a lot of, I read a lot online and I've read a lot about people who are very much struggling with that aloneness, that with that initial isolation. And those of us who are not necessarily supported at home and those of us who are not necessarily safe at home. Um, and I've really, yeah, I, that, that's really affected me deeply. So, I mean, it's, it's inevitably things always come out in your novels. You, you kind of like they're sponges that take up your world. So I, uh, I'm, I'm really like, yeah, moved by those stories and, and learning from them for sure. I'm so, uh, first of all, I'm impressed that you're working on two novels at the same time. It just <laughs> blows my mind. Um, and the second thing that really is interesting, you're not the first writer that we've spoken to who has said like they started working on something before things happened and then it just happened in a way that it just somehow came together serendipitously and it was reflecting what was going on in the world. That's so interesting. I wonder what that's about. I don't know. I think the universe kind of, well, I mean, again, when I'm talking about isolation and, and loneliness, I mean, these are pretty standard things for writers to talk about <laughs> in general, like whether or not we are marginalized or talking about so something. Um, we're pretty much solitary figures in a lot of ways. Um, so I mean that way, but I, I do think there is a certain converse, larger conversation that happens in the world, whether you talk about serendipity or whatnot. I do think that we all are kind of have akin to things like that. So we unfortunately even that even in chaos we 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 know and we, we kind of talk to each other on those levels so. um so you've described particularly poetry as being home for you tell us more about that how does poetry enable things for you that are different than other kinds of writing or other kinds of art and how does it make you feel grounded let me say I love that question. I, I've never gotten that question before. And I really love how it, you know, um, when I received these questions, I don't know if that's kind of inside baseball information, but I received <laughs> these questions a couple of days ago. And I've really been meditating on that idea of why do I say that? Because I've written, I wrote a keynote a number of years ago about the idea of, of poetry as home um, and, and what that meant for me. And it, the idea of, of how um, as an in, and, and I'll, I'll tell a bit about where that came from. Um, because as an indigenous person, when we meet other people from indigenous nations, we address ourselves by not only who we are and maybe who our family is, but who, where we're from. The idea being where you're from tells you so much about what, who you are, you know, and what you surround yourself with. 
And, and not only the, the deeper meaning for, of that is the idea of where you come from, the land on which you are born, it's literally inside of you. It's where the nourishment comes from, where your mother, you know, what your mother fed you in utero and, and, um, and at the breast and how you literally, you know, are from this place that is, is physically inside of you. So really for me, in, in so many ways, that's my concept of home, this very deep kind of internal concept of home. And poetry has always been a part of that. And then the last few days meditating on this, trying to figure out what did I mean by that? Because sometimes, you know, I don't remember. Um, I, I no longer have a, a childhood home. You know, my, the home that I, I grew up in and the many homes that I, I lived over the years, you know, they're gone, they belong to someone else now. My, my idea of home has always been my neighborhood, my city. Uh, there's a park not too far away from my house, St. John's Park, whoopee, that I like to go to. And these are the places that really feel like home because I can remember, because a home to me is a place where you can remember. I remember being a kid and riding around on my bike in the mud along the river. I remember being a young parent, you know, pushing my kids in the stroller all in this park. So this is, this is my home. And poetry is very much that same feeling. You know, it's not a perfect place. It is not, you know, as home never is, but you can kind of remember yourself through this. And through poetry, I remember myself as a young kid who really, really wanted to rhyme so badly. Um, and I was really bad at rhyming. So I wrote some laughable poems that are so damn cute because I was a cute kid. And that's what <laughs> you do when you write poems as a kid. I remember. Uh, writing poetry all through my teenage years when I was angsty and angry and couldn't quite figure it out and I had you know when that I love that feeling and I love watching it in young people where they just start getting so political and it's like the it's like the world opened up and and their brains exploded and I, I love that and I wrote again god-awful poetry uh, through that whole time in my life and then with when my first book came out North End Love Songs which was 2012 now um, that took me a very long time to to write because I wasn't there wasn't the there wasn't, wasn't many opportunities it was rejected all over the place and I had to work <clears throat> really hard for a really long time before I was able to get a poetry book out there so that book was actually the the embodiment of like a decade of my life not only you know a decade of my life but I was I was writing poetry about my childhood so it's like it becomes this kind of this album in a sense and in that way too my poetry is so much closer to who I am um, as as a person and my my real thoughts you know when you when you tell a story you try to get fancy you try to throw in things you try to make a point and use symbols and be smart um, I, I don't approach poetry that way <laughs> I just poetry feels a lot close to that idea of uh, uh, that idea of truth so I guess in that way it feels very um, very comforting and that's kind of I mean everybody approaches poetry very differently poets are uh, poetry I think is the most wide-ranging genre of, of because there are so many different ways and ways to interpret it but I interpret poetry very confessionally um, and very much um, almost as an autobiography if mm. um, so yeah I guess that's that's what where I was thinking of that idea of home and and it's just, it's also my favorite place to be when I'm, poetry only hums for me with when it, things are quiet and things are, you know, I'm able to reflect. So right now is not a time for poetry in my, in my house <laughs> at all. Um, and I miss it. I'm longing for home. You know, there's going to be a day sometime, hopefully soon where I can, again, you, you go home and you kind of, you know, meet yourself again. So that's, that's, that's my, my home of poetry for sure. That's so wonderful. I love the idea of poetry as confession, poetry as biography, poetry as um, grounding yourself in truth. Um, so your best-selling novel, let's talk about the break. Uh, gosh, I was telling you that I read this book recently. I was blown away by its beauty, uh, the truth that it speaks. Um, and I was particularly uh, finding myself quite weepy <laughs> chapter after chapter. And it speaks to a lot of issues that are top of mind today, I think, and top of mind always. Like, I mean, it's, it's not like these are new issues in any particular way. Gender-based violence, police interactions with communities, 
experiences that Indigenous women have, ex have spoken to, intergenerational trauma, intergenerational strength, belonging and displacement, and so much more. And people do talk about storytelling as a powerful way to convey realities. I, I'd love to hear about what you think is the power of storytelling in this conveying of realities and any of the challenges you might feel it has or limitations that it has, which I don't often hear people asking about. The challenges and limitations of storytelling. Um, I do think that it storytelling is very powerful. I do think storytelling is probably um, one of the more effective ways to to teach if teaching i don't know that storytelling it and particularly novel writing is is totally exclusively teaching anything or ever um teaching something but it, it is a wonderful way to convey something that you're trying to if if that is your goal um because i think you can learn from a story and and traditionally if you think of traditional oral storytellers that's how the teachings happen, it's through story. It's not through this didactic kind of lesson of, of finger waving. I, I just see my hand floating up in the, in the user <laughs> world there of the internet. Um, but it's a story, it's a story. And, and through that story, the listener or the reader interpret, a listener in oral storytelling, the reader in, in written, of course, um, interprets what, they, what their takeaway is. So I think it's actually a very powerful way to kind of get into those things that might otherwise um, be palatable. Um, I think though storytelling wider than, and than, than trying to teach, I think stories are supposed to entertain, stories are supposed to really just provide some sort of an escapism if they can possibly do that. I think stories do that so very well. Uh, right now I'm rereading Good Omens and it's the best kind of flavor and you know in the brain that's just like it's so hilarious and I, and I love that. I love stories to be able to take you into a place that you won't normally go to. I've mm -hmm. learned so much about other cultures and other people and other and other beings and ways of being on this world um, through stories you know and I think that I'm I'm thinking of whenever I think of this, I think of the God of small things. Mm. Roy is her last name, the author. Yes. Last name. And I'm sorry. I'm Miranda T. Roy. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Thank yeah. you. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of that, and I learned so much more about her home place mm. than I ever did in any other way. And it's a very specific, it yes. is a very specific way of learning something because you're really just learning that author's world um, in any way. Um, but I love that. I never understood this idea of um, this criticism that people have on book about books like, oh, I just can't relate to that person. Oh, I just can't, mm -hmm. you know, relate to that story. It's like I've I've never related to 90% of the people, the characters in my or I never thought I would relate to 90% of the characters in books because they didn't look like me. They didn't act like me. They weren't from my era, they weren't from my class, they weren't from my race. But it's a human experience. So whenever you whenever you read that story. You're, you're seeing how much we are all alike as much as we are all different. Mm. Um, and I think that's something that story can't, that does better than anyone else, you know? Um, and, and writing in particular and novels in particular, I think can really get into that brain of, and that body of, of those characters um, in the way that I don't think we can in other mediums. Um, I love television. I love movies. I love film. I love documentaries. You know, I love just being that in that experience. But, but we're connecting to different parts of, of people. We're not necessarily hearing the thoughts that are going on in their heads and their involuntary reactions to things, you know, and, and the repercussions of things in, in different ways. So I, I love that for stories. Um, but in that way, I guess we are also limited by stories because we're stuck in people's heads. You know, a story is not like any, I wrote about my home place in my home neighborhood. It's not a universal experience. It's not, it's definitely not historically, it's me accurate, but it's not an accurate in any other way, um, accurate telling of that place. You know, it's a very limited scope. And it's a very, and in that way, we can like dig into people a little bit better, yes. a, a little bit, but we're not getting this full picture. 
you know, I think there can be thousands of stories about, you know, my city and my home place and thousands of people, stories about Métis people and, and other Indigenous nations in this country. I think there can be so many because it is very limited to that very specific and it can only ever be. And I, and I don't proclaim to tell a, his, a popular history of anything. It's really just what's going on in my head, you know, and my, my heart, hopefully. But. Um, something that I learned from the break, which I felt that I uniquely learned from that book and not from other um, kinds of texts or other kinds of teaching and, and school stuff, was the importance of language. Um, you have a, a scene in the story where a, a young woman who has gone through trauma, um, who it doesn't always remember how to speak her language, but there's a point where somebody is speaking to her, a family member is speaking to her and saying, I'm so sad that this happened. Um, and she says, me too, she answers still in English, though she thinks the words first in her language. Um, I think I learned uh, so much, just that deep experience about the importance of language and how you think language and speak it differently and the two may not match and it matters what you think in and what you speak in and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, I think that your book spoke to that in that just little paragraph more profoundly than anything, anything that I've read about that, anything that I've seen about that. So thanks for that. That really stuck with me. That little passage, I'm, I'm just going to always carry that. That made me, I'm, I'm crying thinking about it. Oh my gosh, I, that, that really made me think a lot. Thank you for that. Wow, thank you. Yeah, I, see the funny thing is, I'm totally blanking on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you said about reading, right? The way that you read it, you're going to interpret it and feel it yeah. differently perhaps than the author did or differently than somebody else will. Yeah, and I, I think it's hilarious because people say, oh, this part. And I'm like, really, I wrote that? Oh, that's right, that part? <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I, you know, you write that. I wrote that book. It was published in 2016 already now. So um, I only have read passages since then. Mm. So it's funny. And I actually had to reread because my, my new books are linked to the break. It's kind mm -hmm. of an interlinked world. So I actually had to reread a lot of parts to remember because I remember them differently. Right. And this is something, you know, my editor was was telling me, like, I, I remember things because I, yeah, it's a totally different vantage point, right? So I had to reread my own part to remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I also have folks... baby brain. I'm sorry. Baby brain. <laughs> yeah, baby brain. Baby brain, brain is a thing. It's a real thing and it's a real <laughs> problem. And it's like, I'm just, I, I start everything with an apology for the next year. So. <laughs> no worries. Uh, for folks just joining us, we are here with Katharina Vermette. We're talking about uh, novel writing and, and poetry and all the things that this dynamic writer does. Um, and we're speaking specifically about her novel, the award-winning The Break. Um, and that story is mostly unfolding through the perspectives of women and girls, and you've referred to them as your fictional sisters. Why did you decide to tell the story through these women and girls in particular? Um, though, well, I really liked them. <laughs> and they, uh, they kind of evolved in, into who they became. Um, this is the kind of the, the time when writers kind of, you know, I kind of stick one foot in the practical construction aspect of writing. And then I have another foot in the wishy-washy, you know, um, abstract, hippy-dippy world of they just came to me. And then I constructed them and made them into what I needed them to. But in a lot of ways, they did just kind of, they kind of came. They're very familiar to me. Um, they're very much like my... Um, my, my street sisters, my ceremony sisters. I don't have any real sisters, um, but uh, I have many who are like my sisters. Um, many of my friends and, and family, I was also very careful not to create any character in any one person's image. Um, I really didn't want to take away from any, take from anybody's story that, like a story that didn't belong to me. So in that way, I really did change them into, so that it could be a fictional book and we could, hang around in fiction. Um, there is one character, Rita, though, that was very much um, based on a friend of mine in a very real way. Mm -hmm. But then I had to um, 
and and so I did share that with her and and she um in a very read away laughed hysterically and said fine um but then <laughs> and then said and then I did uh and did say that I was going to take and I and I changed many many things about her so that I was in no way taking from my friends only her big laugh and and just the way she looks at the world which I think is is amazing um and I did want to honor that um so I did, I really wanted to tell a story from about people who look like me, people who in many ways, many of my characters are, are very much like me. They're, they're really just uh, there, but a few choices away from who I am, you know? So that is, uh, they are Métis women. They are from this place in, in this place now called Canada, this place now called Winnipeg. And they are dealing with things that are very familiar to me. I do think, um, you know, again, I 90% of the books that I've read in my life do not have, you know, Métis women from <laughs> the wrong side of the tracks, kind of living in a very working class, if lower class upbringing. And, and you know, people don't necessarily look like me. I wanted to share a book of people that were like me. I wanted to share that with the world. I think we're pretty awesome, us Métis people. I think we're pretty awesome, us little women that, little women, us women who are from this place in the world. I did wanna show that. I really love my culture. I really love my city. I wanted to highlight a bit of that with, um, and I thought it was worthy of that literary attention. I remember I took my MFA at UBC Yes. Um, and I did it entirely online. So I was really having lots of really great conversations with people from all over the world. And I remember another, there was another student who was also from Winnipeg, um, but their stories were based, um, they lived in another, they lived in another big city and their stories were based at kind of like another big city place. And I'm like, why aren't you talking about Winnipeg? Winnipeg's awesome. Like, let's talk about all the, like, I love Winnipeg. It's so gritty and there's rivers and there's you know, <laughs> racism. It's great. Um, <laughs> um, and I remember them telling me that they just didn't like Winnipeg. They wanted to write, um, you know, something that was popular and they didn't want to have to explain where Winnipeg was and what Winnipeg was all about. And that's totally their prerogative. And they hope they went on to great success. I, um, but I really wanted to be very specific in, in the idea, in my idea of setting. And I wanted to be very much talking about that home place that is literally inside of me and, and show that to the world. So I really was excited to kind of do that. Um, even though I'm talking about, you know, trauma and scary things and stuff. I, I, I was very specific about um, that part. And that part, I think um, I wanted to honor, even though we're talking about something very, very, um, very hard. And I, and at the same time, I think that um, because we are talking about this and we are talking, I mean, it, it, we, we're talking about the, you know, the legacy of sexual violence for lack of a bet. Like it, that sounds like a very catchphrasey term for something that's actually incredibly a lot. It, it's incredibly tragic. And I think we, we normalize sexual violence and violence in general so much that we're not we, we talk about it in overtures and not necessarily talking about how incredibly actually tragic it is that people have to live in such unsafe circumstances constantly. Um, but I, when in, in talking about that, I did have to talk about strong indigenous, in, the, in my case, Métis women who have ov overcome, who have survived, who have gotten through because part of my initial questions coming into this very big, scary book that I was writing was the idea of how, you know, mm -hmm. like it was so much about why, why does this happen? You know, beating your hands against the walls. Why um, is it so, is there so much? But also the other question was how, how do we get through this? How do we survive? How do we thrive, mm -hmm. you know? And the answer to that was, these, these aunties and these sisters and these people that have been through it and know the way out and can take care of each other. So I really wanted to show as much as we're talking about the scary stuff, um, for lack of a better word, um, I wanted to talk about the, the strength of that and how that, you know, how, how we get through. You know, so. 
it happened. It was so, so, so powerful to be able to speak to intergenerational trauma. Like I, I get why lots of stories can come out of that, but just in equal parts or even more so in your book, you speak to intergenerational strengths um, and women supporting women and nobody's perfect. Nobody has the answer. Nobody can counsel or be like the answer singularly to each other, but as a group, um, as a collective of women, that there's tons of power, tons of healing in that dynamic. And I'm just mindful, there are sisters, there's aunts, there's grandmothers, there's daughters, there's friends, and there's also foes in these women and girl characters. Tell us about the nuances that you discovered in the process of writing from all these different women, because I, I think it's really important that the books reflect the diversity of, of womanness and that it's not always a happy family dynamic, but there are, there are things to speak to even in that. Yeah, for sure. I, yeah, as, as a writer first, I'm not interested in perfect families and perfect people. I think that they don't, they don't perfect people don't get books. You know, that's a really boring book. <laughs> um, but it is, it is everything. It is, there is a myriad of reactions to traumatic existences. And some of those people go on to thrive and make it and become the, the you know, capital R resilience and whatever. And some people don't, some people fail. Some people fail sometimes and then thrive. Some people make very big mistakes um and again one of the best quotes i like to go through and i um is the idea of hurt people hurt people that's where hurt comes from villains are not create villains are not born villainous you know they are they become hateful during the course of their lives and the things that happen to them many many of which are not their fault um not that and and every i say that knowing everybody is of course always accountable for their actions and, and no matter what happens but i again i mean these these things are these things don't happen in a vacuum um and that's that's really where i'm interest where my interest kind of stays in that idea of characters that there's so many different responses um i actually came about i did want to make a multi or polyphonic polyvocal polyvocal novel I think that's a fan fancy word for it. Um, but I did want to make multiple voices. I wasn't quite anticipating as many voices as I got. Um, actually, what happened in the in the in the writing of the book was um, it was originally four. It was like the core four, and I think that was Cheryl. I always I always get this wrong. Cheryl, Lou, Stella for sure, and Phoenix. I think that was my core four. Um, so I did want to talk about them, and I talked. I, I wrote. Um, chapters based on them but then I was really I really found the difficult parts very difficult to write um, so I'm a very avoidant conflict kind of person by nature so I just stopped writing um, and because that was that seemed like a great answer um, to that question um, and what I did was I picked up a new character mm. so I would pick up like Paul or I pick up Emily or, or Ziggy Ziggy was a godsend I love Ziggy I wanted to write Ziggy all day um, and then I would just start the process over again until I got to the hard part. And I was like, oh, still don't want to write that. Let's, uh, let's write somebody new. And so I would, that's where Tommy came from. Actually, Tommy, the character, the lone male character actually was the last character I created, um, which seems ridiculous to me because he's so essential to the story. He actually like fits everything together. So, but he came last mm -hmm. um, until I finally had, I think I have 10 characters um, and then I had to write all the hard stuff. But actually then at that point it became easier because I had all of these voices to switch off. And as much as everyone was affected in some cases very directly and very deeply, um, everybody had their tools, you know? Tommy was a little bit removed. So he was um, a little easier to write. Ziggy had so much strength and support. So she was, she was easier to write. Emily was devastating, of course. Um, Stella was very much a person who was, um, she was the, the person, um, for those who are not familiar with the book, she um, is a person whose response is vicarious trauma. So not only was she affected traumatically, but it, um, the presence of trauma sent her down a spiral where she was recounting all of these incidents of trauma that she has adjacently experienced throughout her whole life which is again, a different response to trauma. 
everybody responds differently. And so it was actually easier with all of these people around me um, to write all the hard stuff. So I, I'm, I'm grateful for the characters. Um, it also, I was really conscious of writing the story that I didn't want one voice. I didn't want the singular response to something because again, um, and, I, and I've, I've quoted her so many times. I, and again, I'm, um, it's Chimanda Ngozi Adichie. Am I, did I get that right? I hope so. I think so. I think so. <laughs> um, I love it how she, yeah, anyway, her, her our, uh, TED talk of the danger of a single story. And I refer to this several times because I was very conscious of the fact that when this book was published in 2016, it was uh, one of very few Indigenous novels that were published that year. A mm -hmm. um, handful compared to, I think things have exploded a lot in the, in the years um, from that. But I think that it, I was, and, and this has happened so often in, in the history of our literature where there's that one novel and it kind of becomes the stand-in for all novels. You know, I didn't want to have one character as a stand-in for all characters because then suddenly it would be, you know, if I'm talking about uh, Cheryl who copes with her reality by by drinking heavily, um, I don't want that to be the response of the Métis of the Métis woman respond by drinking heavily, or or Lou who responds to her trauma with anger. I don't want to be angry Métis woman all over the place. Um, so instead, I had my responses then to have all of these voices, many more than I intended, um, voices to respond to that. So perhaps it would counteract that. Perhaps we could show some diversity because everyone has a different response. Um, and every like no one culture, no one group of people, no one fa no family will have the same response to something. And I did want to show the multitude of that, um, in a, as well as how it how something can, uh, can affect everybody. It affects everyone differently, but it also affects everybody. You know, yes. we're not free of this. We're all affected by this. That's right. We're all implicated in some way. We, yeah. And I think that we all, um, we all feel it. I think when something happens in a community, however that shape that community is, we do feel it. We're not, even when we're not directly affected. You know, when someone who looks like us is damaged, we feel that and we feel that risk and we feel that danger and we feel that that pain. Not to um, it was so successful, yeah. so successful in, in putting all these characters together, chapter after chapter. And I, I find it so interesting that Ziggy was your favorite to write because Ziggy was one of my favorites to read <laughs> as well, too. Ziggy and Tommy. Yeah, it's just so uh, pleasurable to read, even though, you know, they had their hard parts and their, yeah. their tough, tough experiences. Um, but also, uh, I must say, with the character who um, uh, did did some very awful violence um, behavior, um, to see things from that character's perspective and eyes, it doesn't make it okay, but it helps understand helps you understand like what was going on for this person and why um they might have gone down that that track and it would have been impossible to do with all those characters so excellent mm -hmm. kudos to you like great great job in netting that together um we're going to switch to speak to your short documentary this river okay. uh you speak about the traumatic experience of losing your brother when you were just 14 years old um, and how he was missing for six months before his body was found. And in the film, you said, I think that everything I've done, everything I write about, everything I think about, everything I do comes from that. Because when you're in that, you just need to do something. You need to change something. Um, first of all, what a difficult experience that must have been. And thank you for sharing um, that and being open about that and showing how it fueled you to do something. I'm curious to know what are some of the things you're hoping to change in all you do, as you explain. <laughs> what do I want to change? Oh my gosh. Yeah, um, where, do, where can we start? <laughs> <laughs> Ask a small, like, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> that's funny, because again, I said, you know, I, I did receive these questions. I totally blanked on that one. I don't know. What do I want to, I want to change the world. I want to change everything. 
um, thankfully we have some beautiful and energetic idealistic youth who are changing the world for us so that's great i mean sorry we screwed it up um we tried our best <laughs> thanks <laughs> did we <laughs> yeah you know the, the people before us screwed it up even worse so sure. you know fine. <laughs> layers Somebody, of screw up that now the young ones the babies yeah. have to take care of exactly. yeah exactly but you know what they got the energy for it so we're fine <laughs> <laughs> They're all unemployed now, so they got time. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> oh gosh, I'm I'm being completely sarcastic, and I'm sorry, um, <laughs> um, because unfortunately, like you know, I mean, that, there's some big truth in that because you know we are like huge astronomical unemployment, and the youth are are changing the world, and and and, and I know whenever I think of where I get my hope and where I get my source, I really think of um, these young people who are, again have have the mindset and are, are, are doing really amazing things i think this is absolutely as horrible as this time is i think we're there's so much strength and, and inspirational for again i think inspirational so it's such a limited word it's like i'm inspired it's like what are you inspired to do you know what are you you know yay you're sitting there you know in your comfort being inspired way to go um but it is it is a really it is a really amazing it is amazing to see how how the world is is being changed and formed. Uh, I I too want to change and form the world. I don't know how much I'm going to get to do that in my lifetime. Um, part of what my goal, what where my work centers, and if I had an artistic statement, it's been year, it's been a, a minute since I wrote one. Um, if I had, what I try to do with my work is I try to it is about me. I don't think that we can fully or truthfully tell any other story but our own. Um, and as much as, so I am very specific to my cultural group. I am very specific to my identity groups. And I think that of my characters as very much in that. I don't think that, um, I often have been asked who who I relate to most and who I love most. And that's like, you know, I joke like, you know, this is my favorite. This is just like I joke, this is my favorite child. But in, in reality, you don't have a favorite. You just have someone who is is a different kind of extension of you. I, I feel that my characters are very much like where I would be minus an opportunity or minus a chance, uh, a choice or, or minus a, whatever a support person you know uh, one of the most difficult um characters i i've written and 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 continue to write her name is elsie and she's the mother of phoenix who um uh appears quite quite a bit through the break in interaction though she's not an, a main character um and again she's a person who is battling addiction she's a person who is experiencing homelessness and she very much feels so close to me in so many ways because we are very we are very much a, a few opportunities and, and incidents away from each other you know so i think that um and and those are the stories that i i want to tell i want to tell the stories that i can and i feel like i can tell um i always think that i i think of lots of stories sometimes some women you know every now and then I get the, the inspiration and try to write a story. But if I feel that a story is better told by someone else, mm -hmm. I'm not going to write that story. I'm not going to write the story of, of, I don't know, um, another culture. I'm not going to write the story of a, you know, uh, someone who is um, not of my gender identity. You know, like I think there's so many other stories that I want to know and I want to hear, but you know, are not mine to tell. Right. Um, I also think what I like to show is the balance of life. <laughs> this mm. is a really bad artistic statement, by the way. No granting body <laughs> would ever give me any. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> but I like to show the balance of 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 life. I'm really in, I'm not interested in perfect characters. I'm not interested in perfect people. Um, I'm not interested in perfect poems, um, which anyone who read my has read my poetry would know. <laughs> um, I like brokenness because I like 
fragileness. I love the way that um, people can just come out of things and, you know, just be amazing people and go on to do amazing things. You know, I, I really feel like, I don't think that we are who we are because bad things happen to us. But I was reading this, um, this wonderful, um, no, it was a podcast. I was listening to this podcast on the idea of post-traumatic growth. And it's this idea that yeah. once you stop the stress and stop the trauma and, and dealing with it, you know, um, once you're able to heal, amazing growth can happen. And it's growth that happens not in spite of and not like despite, but it actually, you know, it comes from the lessons you learned from that trauma. I disagree with the idea that trauma actually is good for you in any way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone implied that, but yeah. I don't think it's something that makes you stronger. I think you're strong. And before that, you know, I think you're strong from, you know, the core of your being and who you are. But I do think that we can, once healing happens, then we can learn from that. And we take, we take what happens with us and can do amazing things. And I do, I do love that. And I love the com complexities of that. And I love how people are so imperfect and we can be such angels and such assholes all at the same time. I love that. Um, sorry if I swear. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do that a lot. I'm actually being really good th th today. Oh, you're being amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I did a youth podcast for like the Métis Association of Alberta, and it was the worst possible time to have my F-bomb out. Oh, no. My F-bombs were all over the place. So I'm actually being really good today. <laughs> <laughs> they believed it. It was fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. So I, I do love that. So I mean, if, if that's what I want to show into the world, and that that's... Mm. Um, and um, what my, one of the things that my manager always puts on all of my like bleeps that I always find interesting, an interesting way of stating it. And I'm going to totally like paraphrase. I'm going to, she, she writes it better than me. Um, but the idea of kind of looking closer and the idea of taking these characters that you might think of in one way, but just kind of making them real people. And I'm like, that's wonderful because you know what? We're all real people. We're all like, you know, living, breathing bodies and histories and, and, you know, angels and assholes all together. So that that's really, and if that changes anything, that's great. Um, if that changes how someone might look like, look at someone who looks like me, who, but had different choices and less opportunities and, and everything. Um, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, I think, a, a, a good thing. So. Um, I need to request that you do a poem or a short story or, hey, even a novel called Angels and Assholes. Just think about it. I'm just <laughs> suggesting it for you. Nice. It I like sounds the, like it'll be amazing. <laughs> I like the bleep button it's going. I, I don't hear it, <laughs> but I imagine it. That's right. <laughs> Um, so we're going to actually move to this question around a girl called Echo. Um, that is a series that you're doing, a graphic novel series, um, and your third volume just came out. Yep. Uh, a Girl Called Echo, it's about a time-traveling 13-year-old Métis girl. Tell us what inspires you to develop this character in the series. <laughs> um, yeah, totally real story, you know, like yeah. I was saying, how it, everything, everyone's like me, this totally happened to me. I started time traveling. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Where did Echo come from? Echo came. Um, she is. She is. Uh, she's kind of an everyday girl. Um, she is uh, separated from her mom at this point. She's living with her auntie and cousins. Um, and um, I really wanted to, because she was a graphic novel and because she was so very visual, and I, this is the thing I think graphic novels do better than any other medium, is they really just show these scenes um, and these like very intimate. So I really envisioned Echo as a very quiet character. She's one of those quiet teenagers, you know, the ones that you keep asking questions and they don't actually answer you and they just mm -hmm. kind of grunt. Yeah, those teenagers, you know, I love those teenagers. I have so many in my life. Um, and she always has her, her earbuds on and she's always listening to music. And, and um, because she's separated from her mom, she's listening to her mom's music, yep. um, which is 90s music, which is the only music I can say with any authority. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really. 
me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's funny because originally I was going to have her be really cool and, and be really current. But then my, my daughters who were teenagers at the time laughed at my choices. So then I, I made sure she was listening to 90s music. Oh for my very, gosh. For a very heart, heart, heart felt reason, which is she's trying to connect with her mother. But it's the only way I could, I could keep my, myself cool. Um, so Echo, actually, I wanted to uh, be the I wanted to explore Métis history. I was really looking at um, doing a total deep dive into um, my beautiful nation's history. Uh, we're pretty kick ass people. Mm -hmm. We've uh, resisted the government's efforts to efforts to suppress us for a bunch of times, you know, a bunch of years, a bunch of decades, three, three um, pretty significant armed insurrections um, and 200 years of just um, kicking butt. See, I didn't swear that time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I really wanted to do that. And I, I really wanted to, um, and I mean, to talk about any kind of, you know, people's history is, is a really big undertaking. So I did want to concentrate on this idea of this girl who can time travel and wouldn't that be awesome and where would I want to go if I got to time travel you know um so she really did kind of pop down into um first the Pemmican Wars and then the Red River Resistance and and the last one the third one is the Northwest Resistance or Batash um which happened in 1885 um we're actually just finishing um the pencil sketches on the fourth book which will come out next year and and bring it all home. It's only going to be it thus far is only a four issue book. Um, and I just that was my total fantasy. You know, I'm a total history geek and, and totally love the people that I come from. And I wanted to um, just kind of go visit like it's like, who would you go visit if you got to go anywhere? And I, I would smack myself down and went right in this place in Winnipeg in about 1850. And I would just like, you know, have fun and uh, learned to jig finally um, <laughs> and just embarrass myself dancing um, with um, my ancestors uh, so that that's what echo got to do you know she got to go um, and again she was this very lonely kid who was separated from her mom and experiencing that in her contemporary timeline so part of her um, journey was going back in time and really experiencing this sense of community. The first place she plopped down on, um, plop is such a word, um, but she does. She kind of just kind of comes into um, this past um, and it's great. And, uh, and the first place she comes into is the bison hunt. Um, so the, these traveling, um, migrating bison hunts, um, people would travel, you know, if not hundreds of miles in, in search of bison and then you know hunt a bunch of bison and then you know literally process it en route and stack it up in red river carts and bring it all home um and during this time it's actually you know like weeks and weeks in camps where people took care of each other and and fed each other and sang songs around the fire all night you know like this beautiful sense of community so i i wanted to take that lonely echo girl and just like throw her into this this magical place called 1812 at the time um so yeah it was just a really fun story to have i don't i don't want to always tell the sad stories i want you know and i always do what i want to tell you know some something a little a little more levity so echo has been a wonderful escape it's been totally great um oh i love time traveling i, I love racialized people time traveling that's like my favorite thing that's in the world so, yeah I know. I my daughter watches this show, Timeless. Do we know Timeless? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I I've I've never watched it, but I'm I'm it's on my list because it's a there's a woman. I believe she's a white woman, but there's also a person of color. And they and she says they it's funny because they always make a comment of like any other era that he goes into, <laughs> he can't do anything. <laughs> um, it's not funny, but it's it's so funny when you think about that, like just just the stories that come out of that, right? Exactly. Like, I mean, I would love it. I don't think I don't I think it was a really short lived story. So I would love to just dive into that a little bit more, you know, um, and uh, Octavia Butler, her beautiful book, um, Kindred. Oh, I love Kindred. Kindred. I love Kindred. I reread Kindred like once a year. Um, so just that, like, there's so many important stories that 
can come in, come into play. And yeah, totally, totally. By so people, timeline, let, time traveling, let, let's yes. go. Let's time go. traveling in space, um, 10,000 leagues <laughs> under the sea, yes. uh, everywhere, every sci-fi thing, like uh, going, going where no one has gone before into the nebula. I am here for it. I yes. love it. Yes. It's great. Um, and so great stories coming up. In that oh yeah, time yeah, time. yeah. It'll be great. <laughs> so cool. Um, uh, so we don't have that much time left. Oh, I want to make sure that we get to the questions from the audience. And just speaking with you has been so fun, and you have so many wonderful things to say. I'm just kind of getting carried away. So let's let's allow some of the folks who have had questions put up in the chat below. Let's let them have their time. So Marie Marie Laurie asks. How does the success of your book affect your life and your writing? Um, it, it affects, um, well, the writing, I think, gets better because, <laughs> because I feel more, you know, you know, when I, my first book of poetry came out, I'm, a pretty, I'm pretty sure there was a, a copy or it was 200 copies printed. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, wow, 200 copies. How am I going to sell 200 copies? Um, and actually for many, many months there, they didn't sell. And that's, that answered that question. Um, <laughs> so there, I had a lot of, um, a lot of freedom to, to, to write. Cause I kind of was thinking of writing, like no one's going to read this so I can just write whatever, you know? And, um, when I, when the, that poetry book won the big award and life completely changed and suddenly there was a lot more printings happening. Um, then suddenly the writing for a while kind of stopped. I was writing the break at the time and it got really daunting because I thought, oh my God, people are going to read this. Um, but then actually, <laughs> once you get over the shock of that, you kind of, there's a little bit of, of co no, confidence that are kind of coming like, oh, you know what? People are going to read this. So I was very, very mindful about what I wanted to write, how I wanted to write. And actually, you know, slowly let a little bit of all of this lifelong learning that I've put into developing this craft that I really want to do and said, you know what, maybe, maybe it'll be good and maybe it won't, but that's okay. Maybe I'll write it successfully. And like, and I think successful writing is about like the story you intended to share and the way you intended to share it. Um, all of the awards and the, and the, and the sales are, are, are gravy absolute gravy but the meat and potatoes is actually being able to write what is true to you to write um but honestly the it's enabled me to feed my family and i get to do this as a job which to me is like i'm still living pie in the sky kind of world right now um when the when the governor general award was actually the, the life-changing kind of hinge place because it enabled me to um, buy a house. You know, previous to that, I was, I was a grad student. I was living in housing with my daughters. Um, we were able to buy a house with that. So that is a very practical way. It was life-changing. Um, with my, ed, um, once the break came out, I paid off my student loans. That's kind of cool. Um, and now I get to still live in a house so I can, you know, cause this is my job. I get to, you know, and they have, the bank hasn't kicked me out yet. So, <laughs> so I get to feed my family. I get this, you know, I think that's, that is beyond what I ever thought writing was gonna do for me. Writing was always my passion project and my on the side project as I was, you know, scrambling away and working like so many jobs. So the fact that I get to do this and my children are still clothed and fed that that's great you know oh my gosh that, that answer just great. gives me life that is yeah. so great <laughs> thank you um it's it's really um it just is so so heartening to hear writers making money and living their lives and feeding their children like I, <laughs> it's, it's so sad that that's the baseline that we're working with it's so sad but it makes me happy just to hear that. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, anytime you can provide for your family is a good thing. Yes. And unfortunately, sometimes, and I've been in that case, I've been in that situation where that has been difficult. So I am thankful for any time that I'm able to provide. And if I'm able to provide doing something that I love, that's that's the lottery and and i mean maybe that is sad that you know because we should all be doing that and we should yeah. all be doing that all the time 
Um, and I am eternally grateful that that gets to be my reality, but yeah. And not only do you get to do what you love, but what you are excellent at, because you've said that you, your job is a storyteller. That's your role. Um, that's your role in the community. That's your role in your, your area. That's your role in the world. So that is just so wonderful to hear. We have time just for one more little question. I'm just curious. Robin asks, what is your writing routine? Oh, I love this question. Um, uh, thank you, Robin. Um, it's, I, I love this question because I, um, I have a very strict writing routine, but I'm also really lazy about it. Um, and, and then I like to give writers permission to be lazy. Um, cause I think so much of the creativity happens in the procrastination. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we literally sit here fighting our, fighting for a writing time, you know, even me, I'm, I'm at home and I get to do this for, for a job, quote unquote, um, working at home and sitting in front of my laptop. I still end up spending the whole damn day procrastinating from the actual thing that I really wanted to do and have fought yeah. my life to do. Um, <laughs> which is writing, which is hilarious. <laughs> when I get going, my, my writing schedule is all about getting everyone out of the house, which has been an impossibility this last few months. But um, in ideal times, everyone has a daycare or a job or a school to go to. Um, and then I get to be with my dogs who are amazingly needy, especially once everyone goes away, but I try to ignore them. Um, and I just really like to sit in a comfortable spot. I work best in the mornings. I work best in quiet. I don't write things. I know people who do amazing things and they get to write on their lunch hours and they get to scurry away into corners and, and kind of bump off a few pages. I can't do that. I need a lot more space um, than that. So I need to give myself a good block of time, usually the morning, because then by the time afternoon hits, once lunchtime kicks in and I need my sugar rush, then I need my nap. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> in an ideal time totally naps, never, naps never happen but quiet <laughs> but, but your brain happen. goes into a nap i totally understand <laughs> exactly you have to just stop trying to articulate um <laughs> and then i end up always doing something else so i always do kind of like any kind of like emails or anything that um that's sad anything that requires less attention like email yeah. <laughs> that happens after or I take my dog, my, my, take my very grateful dogs to the dog park because they've been ignored all day. <laughs> and, uh, um, which also helps because I get very intense with the writing. And then I also have to take myself out of that intensity. So, and I always advocate for this because uh, even when you're not writing things that are intense and traumatic and sad and whatever, um, just giving yourself that space to get back into your life. Um, I think is very important because sometimes we don't take care of ourselves enough. And I learned this lesson the hard way, writing the break and making that documentary and not giving myself enough time for self-care um, mm -hmm. or just doing, or, you know, reading a funny novel like Good Omens, total plugging for Good Omens here because <laughs> um, I'm obsessed with it right now. Uh, you know, like any kind of thing you can do um, to kind of help yourself out of that, because th that's where the, ma the magic happens, you know, when you're rested, you know, the better, like the magic happens when you take care of yourself. So that's my ideal writing day when I'm having a writing day that doesn't always happen, obviously, you know, like it, you know, sometimes I'm lucky if I get a couple hours in the morning or any kind of quiet space, but yeah. Oh, that's, um, that's so helpful. Wow. I just love the permission to be lazy. Robin, I hope that helps you yes. um, to hear. Katharina <laughs> says that you can be lazy and that's still part of the writing process. Yes. Thank you very much for that. And thank you so much, Katharina, for joining us. Thank you for just your incredible insights and your wonderful answers. Wow. It was so lovely to talk to you today. Really appreciate having you join us today. Thank you. Thank you. It was a joy. And, and might I say you have a beautiful voice. You, your oh, voice thanks. Is perfect for like radio or announcing. It's just lovely. Buttery smooth. I'm so glad that you <laughs> liked it. I, I'll, I'll call you and just uh, talk you into your writing process. Yeah, How about that? Exactly. Just reading, read a menu. It doesn't matter. You know, just read. Yeah. Burgers and fries. Yeah. Love it. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Thank you. This is well, we look forward to reading more of your stories, your poetry, number four of Girl Called Echo. 
Um, and, you know, just folks, as we close off, I'll just remind you about the Canadian Women's Foundation. As I mentioned, we are really focused on trying to address the gendered impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we know, it's impacting women and girls and uh, trans and two-spirit and non-binary people in really unique ways. Um, and we're, I'm located in the city of Toronto right now, and this morning I was just blown away, but not surprised about the fact that this pandemic is impacting racialized communities and, and folks who make less money in really specific ways. Um, and I think that's a lesson for us to look at all across the country in different regions. I think that we have to recognize this pandemic within pandemics that we have going on. We have uh, gender justice to pursue. We have racial justice to pursue. We have all kinds of forms of justice to pursue. So that's why we're fundraising right now for the Tireless Together Fund. This is to make sure that women and girls uh, from all backgrounds and all communities get the supports that they need uniquely for them. So I'd ask you to please, uh, if you can donate today, do so by clicking the donate button or going to our canadianwomen.org website. And even if you can't donate today, I just wanna make sure that we, we do all the things in our own lives that we can to support an end to inequity that creates things like pandemics within pandemics. So have a great rest of the day. Make sure you take care of yourself. Make sure you take care of your loved ones and stay safe and well. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye, Katharina. Goodbye.